Hey, thanks so much for being here, whether in person or online. We're so glad to have you. The Bible says in Psalm 122, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If you're glad to be in the house of God, say, I'm glad. I'm glad. I said, if you're glad for the house of God to come to you, say, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Amen. Amen. Hey, about five months ago, about 25 weeks ago, we uh, had to flip a switch and we went to an online service. And we, uh, we didn't have a camera, we didn't have anything in place, and we had to figure out what to do in about five or six days. 
And David Moore had a camera at his house, and there's the camera. And Lance had a drone. And he flew the drone all over this building, and I preached to a camera. And I want to take a moment today to give credit and show our appreciation to the people who have helped us be able to be online so that we can continue our worship. Whether you viewed it or people are watching, we've done our best to continue to lift high the name of Jesus. So I want to recognize David Moore and Lance and Thomas and Jason Catawall and the whole team in the back for making this happen. And these guys stay up here sometimes 12 hours trying to get it all right to go online. So we want you to know, guys, we appreciate you from the bottom of our hearts. We wouldn't be here today without you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's give my hand one more time. Thank you, guys. God bless you. God bless you. I want you to give it up for Billy and the band and the singers. This has really been a transitional stage. I'm in a situation that we've all been in week after week trying to figure out what to do. You sing a song and then we're live today, but then you have to wait five or 10 seconds before the next one comes in. It's been a challenging deal. So I want you to give it up for them if you don't mind. Amen? Amen. We're so glad that you're with us today and we want to begin our time with a word of prayer. So if you'd bow with us as we pray, and I'm gonna ask Luke to pray for our country, our world, our church, our family, and this service. Luke, would you pray for us today? Lord, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for being in control, Lord, even when we feel like we are completely out of control. Yes, God. Lord, the future never takes you by surprise. Lord, crisis never takes you by surprise. Yes, God. You are steady even still. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you for who you are in this crisis. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that even though there's, Lord, human leaders in this world, God, that you are the ultimate leader, God, that we can follow. But we can turn to you in all of our ways, Lord, every second of the day, knowing that you will lead us down the righteous path. Father, I pray that you take this world and put it in your hands, Father. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you get this crisis, Lord, this pandemic away. God, I pray that you heal the sick. Lord, that we can go back to our normal lives, Lord, but we can be praising you the whole time, knowing that the only way, only reason we are back to normal was because of you and your victory. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for this service, Lord. I pray that it is glorifying to you because it is sweet aroma. Well, that we can just be a, a people, Lord, unified and praising Jesus. Lord, even as the future, Lord, is unknown to us, God, we do know that we have victory in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, God, for most of everything, we, we praise you for that. Thank you for the cross. Lord, I pray to be with every person in here. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time, God is good. Hey, would you continue to worship with us today? Would you sing to Jesus, our great God?
Thank you so much for your mercy, for your grace, God, for your blessing in our life, God. And God, if you are for us, who can be against us? There's not one that can be against us. God, we celebrate you in this place, in our hearts, God. We just ask for your presence to overwhelm us today, God, that your presence would protect us today. God, let us continue to worship you in every area of our life, God, and in this service, in these words that your messenger is bringing today, God, let them pierce our hearts. We ask it all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, amen, amen. God is good, amen? Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me get this stand. Hold on a minute. I got to get this stand right over here. Y'all hold on a second. <clears throat> Everybody doing good today? Y'all glad to be in the house? Y'all good? Everybody good? I can't see your mouth moving. Kind of looks like you're asleep out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, amen. We're so glad that you're in the house, and to God be the glory. Uh, I was reminded that uh, about this man named Bill, who uh, he was a Christian, and he is reading online one night, and he saw that there was a Christian horseback riding company, and uh, sure enough, he decided he would go check it out, and uh, he went over, and he uh, started talking to the owner of the company, and the owner began to tell him you know, everything about the company and what's going on. It was a Christian organization and tell him everything that was to be and not to be and everything. And he told him, he said, man, we train these horses. We're very, very simple. He said, you know, uh, if they, uh, the way you make them go is you just say, praise the Lord. Say, praise the Lord. See, so you say, praise the Lord. And the way you make those horses stop, you just say, amen. And so Bill thought, man, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. And so he got up on the horse and he said, praise the Lord. Well, sure enough. Horse started walking. He tried it again. 
praise the Lord. The horse started getting faster. He said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, Bill got to running so fast, and him and his horse got to going so fast, he failed to realize and notice that there was a cliff in front of him coming up. Uh, the cliff was coming up in front of him, and uh, he, uh, he was about to go off the cliff, and he, uh, all of a sudden, he just took a big breath, and he said, Amen. And right when he said amen, about the time he got the horse stopped, it stopped right at the edge of the cliff. And old Bill, man, he took a deep breath. And he said, whew, praise the Lord. <laughs> and sure enough, that was the end of Bill and his horse. And I'm just so thankful that that's just the story. And uh, we can't ever praise the Lord enough. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Well, we're in the sermon series. And uh, we've been rolling through this book of James, and so if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and get your Bibles. If you at home and you uh, need to stop the camera and run and get you a Bible, you can. And so, but we're in the book of James. We're studying through this book in a message series entitled Faith in Action, and we're journeying through this book together. And of course, the book of James was written about A.D. 46, and James is the man who wrote it. He is the Lord Jesus' half-brother. And uh, he wrote this to a group of people. He wrote it to some Christians, just like each and every one of us. He wrote it to Christians everywhere. And the purpose for the book, the purpose for the book of James was to help everyone to grow up, to mature, to not just to grow old, not just to be Christians that don't grow in their faith. And he wrote this. And during these few weeks we've been in this series, we've been able to look through James chapter 1, and we've been rolling through this together. And We've come to understand and learn. We've talked about how to profit from your problems. We talked about how to tame temptation. We talked about how to benefit from the Bible. And today, I'd like to talk to you about how real is your religion. We come to these last two verses in this chapter one. In fact, I struggled to preach what to preach. And then I thought about preaching on worship. I thought about just taking time to celebrate Jesus. I thought about just taking all the service and to worship Jesus and to thank him for the benefits and the blessings that God has bestowed on his believers. We've had the opportunity to worship today, to say, God, we recognize you. God, we love you. We praise you. But God gave me a direction to say, I want you to preach on these two verses of Scripture that I hadn't really ever preached on before. And so I want to talk to you today about how real is your religion? James chapter 1 in verse 26. If you got your Bible, say, I got it. Here's what the Word of God says. It says, if anyone considers himself religious, yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his, his religion is worthless. Verse 27 it says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure, flawless, is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Heavenly Father, God, we know this is your word. And God, we come today, God, to get a message from you. And so, Lord, we want to commit our time to you today. And Father, we ask, God, that your Holy Spirit God, we know there is no way for us to interpret the Scripture without the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray, God, today that you would move and you would speak. And God, you would speak so clearly from this passage, God, it would change our life. So Lord, we ask you, Lord, to bless, to bless the reading of your holy and errant eternal word. And God, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. I heard about a group of Christians that decided to go out and tell the community about Jesus. And they began to go door to door, and they were knocking on door to door. And they got to this one lady's house, and they asked her if she would like to pray and receive Jesus Christ. And she said, goodness, no. She said, I'm miserable enough with the religion that I have. Do you know there's a lot of people like that? They are miserable because they have a religion. In fact, two out of every three people say that they are a religious person. The word right here, religion, that we see right here, religious, in the text that we see, 
is only mentioned five times in the New Testament. The word religious, religion, is only mentioned five times in the whole New Testament. And the word means an outward appearance of a religious ritual. And so I'll need you to understand, we talk about real religion. We talk about pure religion. We're not talking about a ritual, ladies and gentlemen. We're not talking about a ceremony. We're not talking about a service. We're not talking about a temple. Real religion is practicing the Word of God. He kind of ends these two verses on the back end of our sermon from last week, how to benefit from the Bible. And he's backing in and he's telling us, I need you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, what real religion is. Real religion is not going to a service on Sunday morning. Real religion is being in the Lord's service each and every day. Real religion is not how high you jump on Sunday morning, but it's how straight you walk on Monday morning. Real religion has very little to do with our worship, our, our, our vertical worship. It has more to do with our horizontal expression. That's what real religion is. He Really, James, we talked about this several times, he has a lot to say about religion in shoe leather. That's really what the whole book is about. It's about maturing. It's about growing up. It's about understanding the truth of God's holy word. It's not just having a form of religion. And so James gives us this. I can't think of a better time in our world than, than we really need real religion. Amen? We need some real religion. We need the people of God that know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior that have been saved, and they come to know Christ, we need them to stand up and stand out in the world. That's what we need in this world. I can't help when I was studying this passage of Scripture. I kept thinking about that song, Miss Ellen, uh, Old Time Religion. Give me some, give me some, give me some old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Y'all remember that song? Give me that old time religion. It was good enough for Paul and Silas. It was good enough for your mother. It was good enough for your father. And it was good enough for me. Give me some old-time religion because we need some old-time religion. That's an any-time religion because it's an every-time religion. And that's what James is trying to teach us. He's trying to let us see the window and understand how real is your religion. That's the question for today. How real? What's your, what's your religion look like? And James basically says, I want to give you three signs that your religion is real. Three signs that your religion is real. Number one, you got a pen, you want to write these down. Number one, real religion is demonstrated by your conversation. Verse 26, here's what the Word of God says. It says, if anyone considers himself religious, yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself. And his religion is worthless. James says, real religion is demonstrated in your conversation. He said the first sign that your religion is real will be determined by how you manage your mouth. How you manage your mouth. In fact, James in this book, he's going to go on in the next several chapters, ladies and gentlemen, and he's going to talk about the power of words. We're going to cover that in a few weeks. He's going to talk about the power of the tongue. Apparently, he talked about the tongue and words a lot in this book of James, and apparently they had somewhere or another in their church that had a problem with the tongue. Maybe they had some people that were gossiping. Maybe they had some people that were being critical. Maybe, maybe they had some people in the church that was lying, and James kept addressing it. Remember, James is the pastor of the local church there in Jerusalem. He's a pastor just like me, and, and he's a fiery kind of preacher. He's a fiery. He, kind of, he don't mix words. He lays it down. He throws it down. He comes on strong. He tells it like it is. And James is reminding us, he's telling us, he said, listen, real religion is demonstrated by your, conversa by your conversations, by the way you talk. And so there's many references in the Bible that talk about the tongue. And so I don't know if you know it or not, but the meanest member in the church is the tongue. 
the meanest member of the local church is the tongue. And James says, you know, when you go to a doctor, he wants to examine you. First thing he says is open your mouth when you want to get a physical, uh, a physical. When you want to get a spiritual physical, James says you need to open your mouth and examine your tongue. And the Bible says, and Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. It says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, what's in the well comes up in the bucket. What's inside is going to come out your mouth. And James is so practical, ladies and gentlemen. He is so practical. And he makes things so simple. He says, listen, if you're really saved, there's really been a time in your life that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you know Jesus Christ, that you've been saved, that you've been baptized. The mark of maturity, remember he's talking about maturity, he's talking about growing up. The sign that you're religious is you learn how to control your conversations. So may I tell you today, if you got words coming out your mouth that are critical, or you're a person that cusses, I mean, you use the Lord's name in vain. I mean, you're cussing. You, you are a person that your mouth is spewing off lies. If you're a person that talks about people, if you're a person that tells dirty jokes, may I tell you, based on the Word of God, what James says is that you're not mature. You're not a mature Christian. You're not, there's no sign that you have a real relationship. You got a false idea. James is saying, I want you to understand there's a difference between having a real relationship with Jesus, having a real religion, and a false religion. You know, talk is cheap, but words can be expensive. It can cost you your testimony. It can cost you your witness. It reminds me of that young man young father that came home one day to his wife and he came home he came in the door and his wife was crying uncontrollably and he said honey what, what's wrong what, what what's wrong what, what's going on she said well little baby he he cut his first tooth and he took his first step he said well uh that that's that's good honey that's good that's good news that's good she said but yeah but after he cut his first tooth and he took his first step, he fell, and he bit his lip, and then he said his first word, and it was a bad word. Sometimes we need to remember that there's people always watching us. There's people always looking at us. Your children are watching you. May I ask you today, what words are coming out of your mouth? James says right here, real religion, if you're real, if you have a real relationship, Real religion is demonstrated by your conversation, the words that you use. And then he makes this bold statement at the end of this verse. Here's what he said. He says, if anyone considers himself to be religious and does not keep a tight rein, that means to control your tongue, he deceives himself. He fools himself. He tricks himself. You see, a lot of people... They, they, have, they trick themselves into thinking they're religious when really they're not because a mature Christian, a mature believer, he controls his tongue, he controls his mouth, and then he says he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. That word worthless means dead. It means it's no good. It's not any good. You say, well, Burr, what does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it means. Either number one, if you say you're a Christian and you're religious and you can talk how you want to, listen to me, if you can cuss and you can talk and you can tell lies on a daily basis and not be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God that that was wrong, well, then you need to check out your salvation. That's what James is saying. He's laying it on the line. If you can continue to have a mouth that breathes destruction, if you have a mouth that's critical and cussing and you have that and you are not convicted at all, guys, you need to evaluate your salvation, number one. Number two, if you are a person that uses foul language, 
or can talk about others and not be convicted, either number one, your religion's dead because you don't know Jesus Christ, or number two, you become calloused to where you no longer listen to the Holy Spirit of God. You say you're religious. You say you're a Christian. I've, heard, I've seen that my whole life as a minister of the gospel. I've seen students and teenagers and, and, and businessmen, businesswomen. They, they say that they, they're Christians. They're strong Christians. But I, in fact, I've been around some of them that they'll, I'll be standing there and they'll say, hold on a minute, preacher. And they'll uh, let light into someone and cuss them out and then look back at me and go, I'm sorry. Either number one, they're not a Christian, or number two, they're calloused in their walk with Christ, and they're, they're not listening to the Holy Spirit. They're not following the lead of the Holy Spirit. They're not obeying, and their religion is dead. Number two, let me give you the second point. Real religion is not demonstrated by your, is demonstrated by your conversation, and real religion is demonstrated by your compassion. Look at this verse 27. It says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure, flawless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Here's what the Word of God says and what James is saying. He said, not only will you watch your mouth, not only will you have a clean mouth, he said, not only will you as a religious person, a Christian, a person that's in relationship with Jesus, you, the results will be a closed mouth, but it will be an open heart. You have an open heart. You will have compassion for one another. And so he, he makes this point. He said, you look after orphans and widows. And so he's not just saying your compassion is confined to orphans and widows in this text right here. He's making a reference to two groups of people. He's saying the orphans because they're, they're homeless. And he's saying the widows because they're helpless. And pretty much that covers everybody around us. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes in and dwells us. If we really got saved, and there is no way, ladies and gentlemen, not to love people. If you walk around with hate in your heart all the time, and you're critical and negative, and you're not moved by that, and you don't have any compassion, any love in your heart, you have to evaluate your life and see if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. He says, real religion is demonstrated by your compassion. God's called us to love one another. That's what the book says. John chapter 13, verse 34. It says to love one another. He said, how will they know, how will the world know that you are a Christian? How will they know that you're religious? How will they know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? It's by how you love. He said, we got, God has called us to love one another, to forgive one another, to accept one another, to encourage one another. That's what God has called us to do. He's called us as Christians to reflect him. I've said this many times in marriage counseling, and I try every person I've ever had the opportunity to do their ceremony, I try to always evaluate and help them to make sure that they know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior because I really feel like I'm doing them an injustice. If they get into a relationship they don't know Jesus Christ, there is no way for them to love each other the way that God designed them to love without Jesus Christ being in their heart. But once he comes to live within our hearts, we have to love. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you want to love God and love people. He said real religion is demonstrated by your compassion. I love that story in Luke chapter 10 about the good Samaritan, the man that uh, was traveling from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves and robbers, and, and uh, he, they beat him up and they robbed him. And there's three different people in the story. There's the, there's the beater-uppers, there's the passer-uppers, and there's the picker-uppers. And God wants us all to be picker-uppers. He said real religion is demonstrated in your conversation and it's demonstrated in your compassion. He said, how can you know that you're my disciple? By how much you love one another. It's how people talk. It's how people love. Number three, let me give it to you real quick. He said real religion 
is demonstrated by your conduct. Here's what the word says in verse 27. It says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and flawless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The word world right here in the Greek simply means a society without God, and the word polluted means to be contaminated by the world. So here's what the world, this is what James is saying, practical kind of guy. He said, if you're a Christian, you know Jesus Christ, and you say you got pure religion, I want to ask you today to take the tongue test and see how you talk. I want you to take the heart test and see how you love. And then he said, I want you to take the feet test and see where you go and what you do and how you act. He said, because real religion is demonstrated by your conduct. You see, we have to be in the world, ladies and gentlemen, but we don't need to be of the world. We don't need to let the world rub off on us. We need to rub off on the world. I like what old Vance Havner said. He said, you don't have to dress up like a clown to witness the circles. So we don't have to dress up like a clown to witness the circus. And the truth is for all believers, for you and for me, for all of us, We've been called to be a light in a dark world. We've been called to have a pure religion, a right religion, a Christ-like attitude. God said, I want my Christians to be different. I want them to talk different everywhere they go. I want people to be able to tell that they're different and say, my religion is real. It's not a fake religion religion or a false religion, but it is a real religion. God said, I want my followers, I want them to not only talk right, but I want them to love right. I want them to love one another, to pick each other up, to find somebody that's hurting. We all make mistakes. We all have to forgive, but God wants us to love. And he said, I want my children, I want them to be in the world, but not of the world. I want them to to be in the world, but I don't want them to act like the rest of the world. Can I ask you today? When you're around your friends, can they tell any different that you're a believer or a non-believer? Do they know you're a follower of Jesus? I like what my buddy Frankie told me one time. He said someone was trying to describe what a Christian was. He said, ah, ah, man, a Christian, ah, ah, ah. There he goes. Just watch him. Just watch him. Because he'll be a reflection of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of that story about a high school football player that got saved. He accepted Jesus Christ. And it was a real relationship. You know, some people get saved, you can't ever tell any difference. But that old boy got saved and his life turned around. He began to live for Jesus. Not just on Sundays, not just in the service, but his attitude and his action began to change. He began to live different at home with his parents. He began to respect them and respect their authority. Everywhere he went, he was a reflection of Jesus Christ. And he lived for Jesus on Monday. He lived for Jesus on Tuesday. He lived for Jesus on Wednesday. He lived for Jesus on Thursday. He lived for Jesus on Friday nights. He lived for Jesus on Saturday. And he lived for Jesus on Sunday. It wasn't just a Sunday religion. It was an everyday religion. The old boy was such a good receiver in high school. He had the opportunity to go play college football. He got a scholarship. And he went to a college and he began to play. Man, he was an all-star athlete. He began to play wide receiver. And on one given night, a rivalry game, it was homecoming. And the quarterback stepped back in the pocket and he slung the ball to the end zone. And the old boy laid out and he landed on the ball. The referee put his hands up, said, touchdown. The old boy got up. He knew he had trapped the ball and he did not catch it. The coaches were going crazy. His family was going crazy. His teammates were going crazy. He got up, took that football and gave it to the ref and he said, I I didn't catch that ball, I trapped it. They lost the game. 
May I ask you today, what would you do? If you were in that situation, or your kids were in that situation, and they, you knew the game was on the line, what would you do? Because whatever your answer is, is going to tell you whether your religion is real or it's fake. Whether it's just a Sunday morning religion, and it's not a through the week religion. You see, God's called us to be different in a tough time. James says, I need you to understand in these two simple verses. And really, these two simple verses, it's an intro to the rest of his book. And we're going to cover the rest of those three things. He said, real religion is demonstrated by your conversation. Real religion is demonstrated by your compassion. And real religion is demonstrated by your conduct. May I ask you a question today? Can you take the tongue test? Can I ask you today, how's your language? If I followed you around being the preacher, it's so funny. Christians, they, right when the preacher comes up, man, they, they all get quiet, man. In fact, they'll, it, you can always tell they're either talking about me or something. They'll get quiet. Or, or, or maybe when the preacher's walking around, they, they say a cuss word. They look over at me like, oh, me, oh, my goodness, I didn't mean to say that, preacher. Like, I'm different. God's bigger than me. God's with them all the time. If you really belong to Jesus, I hate to tell you, I want to tell you, Jesus hears you all the time, not just the preachers. So I'm asking you today, how's your language? How's your mouth? Will you take the tongue test? Will you take the heart test? Is there anybody that you hate today? And then will you take the character test? How's your conduct? Character is who you are in the dark when nobody else is looking, nobody else knows. I challenge you today, if you're not right with God, to get right with God. And have a religion that's real. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, my I tell you today, you can accept him. It's a free gift. A free gift of salvation. And all you have to do is invite him into your life. There is no way to get to heaven apart from a relationship with Jesus. Jesus Christ loved us. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And there is no way to get to heaven apart from a real relationship with Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, whether online or in person, there is only one way. I stand here today to tell you there is one message to Burr Lovett. His name is Jesus. He's always going to take you to the end of the story because Jesus Christ will change your life if you'll let him. Today, if you don't know Jesus, would you pray and receive him as your Lord and Savior? Would you pray with me? Bow your head, close your eyes. If you'd like to invite Jesus Christ into your life, just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and save me, Jesus. If you forget all that, just say, I'm not perfect, Jesus, but I know you are. Save me, change me, make me your own. Just say that little prayer. Give your heart to Jesus. Today, if you prayed and received Jesus, I want to encourage you to tell someone today. And if you're here in this audience, and something about these words from the book of James has convicted you, would you get right with God? Would you evaluate your life? Would you evaluate your tongue and your heart and your feet today? If there's any sin in your life, may I encourage you to ask God to forgive you? Just ask Him. He's a loving father. To say, God, I repent of my sins today. And I ask you to change me and make me more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. And Father, now God, we pray, God, that your message would penetrate your heart and our lives. And God, change us to be more like you. God, help us have a religion that's real, God where people can see you in our lives each and every day. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us online. We look forward to seeing you on Wednesday on your dose of hope. God bless. Have a great week, everyone.